I want to welcome James Barfoot to the KCHW studios. Welcome, James. Well, thank you. I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the invite. It's all good right. to be here. All right. All right. Long trip from Spokane. Round of applause for getting up early. <laughs> thank you, James. <laughs> <laughs> all right. How was the drive in from Spokane? It was good. You can see it's a little smoky out there this morning, but it was so pretty watching that sun. And all right. Now, is it uh, smokier in Spokane or here? I'm just kind of curious. I, I think it's pretty similar. Pretty similar. Pretty similar. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. There, that fire, uh, we, cover, we did a little break this morning on up to 34,000 acres. So that's a big one. Wow. Right. All right. Yeah. Uh, we are live on YouTube this morning on the KCHW website on the Listen and Watch page. And uh, you can pick us up on your phone apps, too, if you'd like to. If you're heading towards Spokane and want to listen to it, uh, that would be on uh, TuneIn or Radio Deck. You can listen that way, too. Also, if you have an a, a Android phone, you can uh, watch the video on the website if you use the Puffin brand. Browser. There you go. All the ways to listen, and uh, we're going to turn things over uh, kind of to Daisy. But, James, let's yeah. have you start off uh, just by telling us a, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, you know, people would ask, what do I do? And I, I, I would say, well, I'm a uh, behavior change coach and a clinical hypnotherapist. And their eyes would kind of glaze over, and <laughs> then I'd realize i got to find another way to explain it. So what I do with uh, with people. I, I help people to align their actions with their intention. And that is a statement that I think can make more sense when you look at we all want to achieve things in our life and quite often the actions that we're doing aren't in alignment with that. So what I want to do and the, the reason for that of course is because um, if you any of us, let's say we joined a gym in January, how many of us quit by February? Lots. And yeah. a, lo a lot of people do. And, and you would say they had a positive intention to do something. But then what happens is life gets in the way. Life gets in the way. We, we actually set our, uh, our regular routine aside in order to now join the gym. And you know, we, we get to the gym, we say we're going to do it three, four days a week. And that's fine until somebody comes to visit or, um, you know, something shifts at work. Maybe we're working longer hours. Or maybe we realize we've been giving up something we like doing on Wednesday nights. And now we're taking that away. So, sure. so what we have to do with behavior change is look at, um, really, it's about convenience. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But Daisy may actually have some questions here for me. <laughs> yeah. I, first of all, I'm, I'm just curious about how you got started. Kind of give us a little background in, in your expertise and how you got started, James. Well, I have always been a pretty curious person. And uh, I really spent a lot of time figuring out what made me tick. So I spent a lot of years of my life working with some pretty enlightened people that were able to um, mentor me through the process of understanding my own, you know, what makes me tick and how to live that full rich life. Uh, in fact, get out of my own way is how I'd explain it when I was younger, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've had a lot of businesses and things, but um, I had the support of a teacher for about 20 years. And what really motivated me was how much he gave you know, he was really committed to helping people in whatever way he could. And he happened to uh, pass on in 2007. And I thought, well, I'm not him. I, I can't, I don't feel capable at this time of doing the, the work that he was doing. Because um, I would say he was an enlightened man. And what I did is I said, well, what, what can I do? Because I think that that's important to look at where am I at here and what do I have to offer? And so what I did is I went over to Seattle and studied clinical hypnotherapy and uh, also NLP. And NLP is, they call it neuro-linguistic programming. Really, we're all programmed in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all operating out of certain programs, and we need those. I always say we're like walking programs. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> yeah. definitely a way yeah. of, of, of phrasing it. And so if you look at it, we're all in a sense programmed. 
And we have routines. You get up in the morning, you have your cup of coffee, or maybe you brush your teeth, or whatever you do, but those are routines that get us through our day. Well, and actually science is proving now that we are, in a sense, because of our DNA, because of patterns, because um, habits, and so forth. And it is coming down to that with all the research I'm doing mm -hmm. um, on positive psychology, which, uh, you know, s yes. sounds like what you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, what is positive psychology? Well, uh, yeah. it's re it's basically kind of reprogramming in, a, in, in the higher language realm of, say, like what you talk about gratitude or mm -hmm. compassion mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. things like that. What would you say about the positive psychology piece? Absolutely. In fact, um, it's interesting because so psychologists have done studies and determined that uh, essentially we run this narrative in our heads every day. And... The narrative is what often either moves us forward or stops us. And so they've estimated there's up to 5,000 words or phrases a day that are repeated. Wow. So that is our programming. That's, that's the story we hear when we say, oh, you know, uh, for a guy I could say, hey, he, you know, you see a, a cute gal and you want to ask her out and the voice comes up and says, oh, she'll turn you down, buddy. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's a story, right? Is it true? Or I remember my, my ex-wife, I lived in Texas for a long time, and my ex-wife, she said, uh, oh, we should, we should learn to two-step. Well, she already knew how, but, you know, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what happened to me, I felt this twist in my gut, right, that said, you know, you don't want to get out there and make a fool of yourself. And I was already, you know, in my early 40s by then. So, you know, and what was that? Where did that come from? I was probably... 15 years old and hugging the wall of the gymnasium in high school and I was terrified to get up and dance so even though I'd done that and of course I went and did it and got through it but those are stories those are stories and Daisy why do you suppose those stories are there I well the DNA um, yeah. if parents uh, actually programming subliminal programming um, yeah. The habits, choosing ways of living, um, not being aware yeah. maybe. Yeah. I think awareness is our first thing is become aware of them and say why mm -hmm. and question them and, and, and maybe say, hey, maybe uh, d have a desire to change it I think is yes. a really big point. Well, and, and I should have phrased it also is what is that story doing? What did it do for me, right? When it said, you know, James, don't get up there, right? It didn't it want me. It gave you a negative. Right. right? It gave me a negative. Fear. It also was, yes, yeah. but it was really the, the baseline of this story is protection, security. So don't risk, right? Put yourself and, out there. Yeah, don't put yourself out there because you might make a fool of yourself. Now, maybe, you know, we, we heard that story too because maybe mom wanted to protect us and said, you be careful, don't do this, don't do that, right? Or dad. Right? We don't want to blame mom, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but she, and she had a positive intention in that too, didn't she? You know, so this story really gets created. And to really live life to the fullest, we've got to get outside of that story. Yeah. And so yeah. That, that's actually where uh, hypnosis is powerful because what it does, it, it enables us to create a new story and to weave that, um, to weave that story into our existing story, what it does is it starts to give us new resources. So now when a, a new opportunity comes up, all of a sudden we're like, we feel ourselves more compelled to do something uh, that's different rather than something that has stopped us before. We're willing to take that risk more. So and what happened to me, because I try to be an intentional fool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you he know, what? pretty good at it. <laughs> and that, that's a cool persona, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, I think I was kind of that guy when I was in high school, you know, who was, you know, e e easy, easy to joke, kind of the, um, I don't know, I was completely the class clown, but I had that. Everybody has a way of, um, kind of communicating with others and finding an area that they can do that in where they feel safe. Sure. You know? So, um, but, but that's it. It's about the personal story, and I do a lot of work with that, helping people to first identify that story, um, look at what it's been doing for them, because there's always a positive intention and oftentimes a negative outcome. So I have several mm -hmm. 
friends yes. that are, uh, let's say, uh, middle-aged or a little bit beyond that are signal, single. Yeah. A- and one of the things that, you know, we, uh, that, that comes up in conversations is how hard it is for someone, and I'll just go ahead and say over 50, mm-hmm. that, that's trying to start over in a relationship to get by all the pain of the past. And mm-hmm. I know there's like, if you've been in a bad relationship, there's all that subliminal uh, programming that that's in your head. Maybe, you know, you're not good enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and, and then, and then those can bleed into a hundred other things, but, but do you get, I mean, how can, how can you help those kind of things from like uh, past relationship wounds that uh, to keep you from carrying them into the next one? You know, the best way, uh, and, and certainly I recommend uh, that anybody that's been dealing with that, you know, do some, do some therapeutic work. You know, there's no, uh, it's not necessarily a quick fix, but by understanding process. And there's some great books out there, too. Um, you know, as I came out of a relationship, I was reading a book called Conscious Uncoupling, which is fantastic. Wow. You know, so doing that kind of work is good. What I will help a person with when they come in is to help them diminish that charge, you know, so that um, the breakup is often a pretty difficult experience, and it can be a healing experience if you handle it correctly. Uh, There's no right or wrong, but there's better ways to do it, right? (laughs) You know, uh, because bitterness and hate are not good allies, you know. (laughs) (laughs) But all of us feel emotions, right? It's not an easy thing. we, so when they come to see me, what we do is we work on what you really want, you know, going forward. You know, I, I appreciate where you're coming from, and, and there's going to be a healing process that goes on with that. The subconscious mind. But what do you want to be? Yeah. I like that. It's right. so freeing. It's yeah. like I think, oh, it's like characters on a stage. What character do I want to be? Mm-hmm. So it's like um, kind of shape-shifting or changing coats every day. And at, I like that aspect, James, a lot. Like. Who yeah. do you want to be? <laughs> well, and what do you want? Yeah, I mean, what do you want? What do you want in your and life, right? And asking those right? questions. And, and not just the superficial stuff, because it's real easy. Uh, I'll blame us guys, but, you know. <laughs> when we, when I we, know where you're going yeah, with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, sometimes we Here, can. let me help you get unstuck. <laughs> you, exactly. You know, I mean, and anybody that's done any dating, and, um, you know, you can get on one of the dating websites, and it's all about check the boxes right and you want somebody who's uh, blue eyed you know blonde hair to certain characteristics or the one I always found personally offensive tall dark and handsome well there you go (laughs) kind of I would have to say that's probably similar thing for me as well so don't feel bad okay (laughs) I never make that one yeah you know and so I, I had an interesting happen a few thing happen a few years ago with that and that I had did end up going through a divorce, and as I wanted to move into a new relationship, I was doing a lot of work on that and uh, that intentional piece. And what I, I think what you want to look at is what you really want on a deeper level rather than, you know, you want certain characteristics or, you know, they're making a certain amount of money or they're this or they're that or, you know, let's get down to what the root thing is, right? So I looked at You know, wanting, you know, I don't care what she looked like. I mean, be honest with you. I asked that I be attracted to her and she to me, right? Because that's real because I don't care what other people think. I'm only caring what I think. And how am I going to relate to that person? I want her to be self-contained, right? So she's able to take care of herself. I'm not setting an amount of money, you know. Does she need to make 100000 a year? No, you know. Do I? That'd be wonderful. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> but but what you want to look at is that self-contained piece, and somebody that will share, you know, it, you know, you're looking for that heart connection, right? So somebody that shares maybe your similar values, etc. But not to get hung up on the external stuff. And I did pretty well. I. I Ended up meeting a lady. We lasted two years, and it was wonderful. And now I'm starting again. (laughs) You know, but you know what? That was great. Now I'm looking at um, the next round of that, and we're still friends. She is an amazing woman. It just certain differences, right? That over time. So James, you're saying that when you talked about getting Mm -hmm. outside of what 
the change that you want to make is. Mm -hmm. um, getting outside of Getting outside of it rather than focusing on it. Is that what you're talking well, about? Kind of like instead of, okay, I've got this problem and I want to change it. Mm -hmm. You're talking about getting outside of it somehow. Well, or, or going a little deeper into the underlying deeper. things. Yeah. You know, it's like, let's say, so what do I do? I'll give you an example. I do a two-hour session when somebody comes to see me. And we're going to spend the better part of an hour talking, really delving into what it is that they really want mm -hmm. and looking at what might be holding them back from that. So the so blockages. That's, that's You're going to look at the blockages. Right. Okay. And also looking at what we talked about earlier, which is that if I'm doing something, I'm doing it because I, I and at least initially it gave me a benefit. You know, it was doing something for me. Now you might look at it and go, well, how could that be healthy, right? If it was a particular behavior and you said, why, you know, if even, even something like, um, well, you could take smoking would be an example. It's giving people I was going to bring that up. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a classic, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I, one of the questions I ask people as we do that interview with, you know, with smoking, because I do a specific one for that, is, is, this, is the cigarette your friend? You know, <laughs> and most often it is. Yeah. So it gives you somewhere to take your stress and your tension and also to kind of refocus. A, a lot of people are working a task at work and they come up against a difficult thing and then they, they just take a break and go have a smoke, right? Right. So there are certain benefits, but then the long-term benefits are horrendous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. The short-term ones, you know. So uh, yeah. given that subject, yeah. how would you, I mean, when I, they call smoking cessation or mm -hmm. or yeah. whatever someone's yeah. going in to get hypnotized for right they go and put them under somehow mm -hmm. and convince them that they're out and then they start programming them is that what you do well there's no convincing <laughs> no no convincing at all really you know what was um, the old pendulum and no actually <laughs> that's interesting because that's the old school way of mm. viewing it that's so yeah you know, that's so 1950s, you know, <laughs> I know. I <laughs> or just wanna, earlier. I, I just want to clear yeah. that up and or, make sure that people or, understand what, what yeah, type of hypnosis Yeah, because what I do about. is is absolutely, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is the structure of how you talk. So mm -hmm. talking to somebody in, find, what I do is I take what they want to tell me, I recreate it into hypnotic language. Hypnotic language is designed to get past the critic. You know, the, the critic is the one who says, oh, well, hypnosis won't work. Right? right? And yet we're all hypnotized every day. I mean, we're programmed like we talked about earlier. So something's working, yeah. you know, but actually hypnosis is designed through the language we create. Uh, th they can give me language. I restructured in a way that is going to get past the critic. I used to play hockey. So I use an analogy of, uh, you know, you're, you're coming up on the goalie and you want to score and get that puck into the net. Well, the goalie is really the conscious mind the critic part, you know, that is saying, I'm not going to let this happen because I'm not sure that I trust what you're going to tell me, right? Sure. So what my job is to do is to put the goalie to sleep, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so through the language, what <laughs> it's funny, it isn't is it? Funny. You know? it's, it's so but true. Yeah, if you could see the goalie, it wouldn't be a very effective yeah. goalie, right? Oh, and what if the goalie's redhead? Because <laughs> uh, I, I heard that redheads are harder to put sedate. <laughs> we had it on the uh, one Is of our news right? stories. One yeah. of our news stories. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a, a, some kind of statistic. I hadn't noticed that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, yeah, that's an interesting thing. So, so then what I do is, um, because of the induction piece, which is all about relaxation, I, that's a good part. Especially initially, you want to have a pretty long induction, or just letting people really get comfortable with it. And so the messages then start to slip by, and before you know it. It's not as though a person, because people perceive that, oh, I need to be knocked out. That's not the case at all. In fact, most people will remember a large part of what you said to them, or at least portions of it, and they, they may notice they're going in, in and out of kind of a dream state more yeah, than yeah. anything. Yeah. I was, I was accidentally it. hypnotized. You were. <clears throat> I was, in, and Daisy's already heard this story, so it'll be kind of boring for her, but oh. I was <clears throat> DJing at a nightclub, and we had a hypnotist come in. Mm -hmm. And I was running the, the sound and lights for him. Mm -hmm. So I had to focus on him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, mm -hmm. I, my boss came in about, I don't know, probably three quarters of the way through the mm -hmm. show to tell me something. He came up in the booth. And I remembered him standing there 
and <coughs> talking to me, but I couldn't hear him and I wouldn't acknowledge him. But I knew he was there. But I was so focused on this guy and somehow through, you know, he had like 12 people on stage. He was a stage hypnotist. But somehow through focusing on him a and maybe like what you're talking about, this language that you use, mm -hmm. I could not stop focusing on him. Mm -hmm. I was not, you know, he wasn't picking on me like he was the crowd, but I could not, and my boss literally had to take my head, turn it toward him and shake me, and then when I snapped out of it, he started laughing and pointing at me going, you were hypnotized! You were hypnotized! <laughs> you were so hypnotized! Uh, yeah, and, and, and that is very natural. You know, that's uh, oftentimes, and uh, the friends of mine that do stage hypnosis will say, they're going to pick the people out of the crowd that are already hypnotized. You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's right? it, that dude. Yeah, yeah. you're going to pick the people. That are, yeah. And I, I, when I was, oh, probably 20 years old or so, I actually traveled across the country with a stage hypnotist. We were doing high school. So that's where I got my first experience. And I had your experience. I was working the lights and paying attention to the music, the sound, his voice. I fought it. I caught it before I went under. Wow. That, you know, otherwise I would have forgot to work the light. <laughs> no, you, you wouldn't. Ha you wouldn't have. Uh -huh. I didn't miss a beat. Uh -huh. You know, even when he needed a little puff of smoke. You, you, yeah. you know, I didn't miss a beat. I was totally in tune with that. But there as was something else did. going on. Yeah. yeah. As long as I didn't get called up on stage yeah. accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, I did not hear that story yet. And if I yeah, did, really? I forgot because you tell a lot of stories. Uh, <laughs> that's a great. That is a great story. And perfect it is a good example. story. Yeah. Now, my, my next is. question yeah. to go along with sure. that is what I want to know, mm -hmm. and because I'm very interested in doing this I've been I've quit smoking a couple times and yeah. started again a constant yeah. constant battle for me over the past really 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. he managed to quit for three months about a year ago and then started back up again oh, okay. it's it, yes. it's just it's ridiculous uh, one of one of the main things that that I have in the back of my head that, that I want to do for me mm -hmm. and and one of the things I had a friend who got hypnotized to quit smoking this is the way he put it and I'm sure this isn't the proper lingo but I'm gonna use you know layman stuff and he said that he was so upset he quit smoking from it but he said the hypnotist associated something so vile mm -hmm. with cigarettes and disgusting and he said the problem afterwards is anytime he saw one smoking and he wouldn't tell me what the vile and disgusting thought was yeah. but he said now anytime he sees anyone smoking that's the first thing he gets it really stuck with him and he was very upset about it well so so yes. if there's a horror story out <laughs> there like that what what do you do and and, and how do you uh, perceive what I just told you absolutely that's old-school stuff <laughs> yeah that's called aversion therapy I mean that's basically and and it, it can be effective but then there's that what what stays behind it's yeah like negative program so else. I'm again I always look forward I mean um, and, and that's my thing, is I'm always <coughs> wanting to create the benefit of being a non-smoker. So that's going to be what we focus on. And, and of course, we're going to address the negatives in terms of, um, you know, some of the things that you don't want. But mostly it's about moving forward. <coughs> you know, moving forward and creating uh, a life. All the benefits of being a non-smoker. I do a two-session program. And uh, you know what? It's 350 bucks. It's worth every dime. You know, it's two hours each session. You're going to spend that in two months of smoking. <laughs> well, right. yeah. And some, right. some, old, some. I, my oldest client was an 82-year-old uh, lady that had been smoking since she was 13 years old, two pack a day smoker. You know, so she was spending at that time probably three, 350. Easy peasy. 400 dollars. Did you break something? I don't know. I just knocked something. <laughs> is, are we still on the air? We're still on the air. <laughs> Did your monitor oh, go out? That's, right. That's all right. That's all right. She's all right. good. Yeah, she okay. just kicked it and it went. Yeah. yeah. I heard she it was quit. getting excited about She was thinking she wanted to quit smoking. And She'd have to start first. And, and then, then I was, well, I was actually <laughs> wanting to cover this research really quickly <laughs> okay. here. That, yeah. Okay, first of all, in summation, the hypnosis is uh, uh, communication that bypasses our conscious mind mm -hmm. and delivers information directly to the subconscious mind where it can be effective in creating the desired changes. Mm -hmm. So that's basically very scientifically said. Yes. And there's MRI research that um, y has verified that. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That yes. So what does that? Serve? What, well, basically so parts of the brain. Or yeah, you're thing? when when you it work? it's firing it off different areas of the brain when you go under hypnosis and okay. it's getting you know it, it's I used to of course before the um, you know the internet was so easily accessible and 
you know, you'd have to go and dig in and find stuff. Now I get a client call me, you know, I have this issue and I may or may not know, I, I know I'm a good hypnotist, but I haven't worked with absolutely everything, but I want to do my research. I Google, you know, pain and hypnosis and you get about 20 different things that come up easily and talk about the benefits and, um, you know, the, uh, what was a big one for me was uh, dementia. I, I hadn't really oh, wow. thought much about wow. dementia and, and I, I was called by a lady that said my, you know, my father's getting dementia and she, I said, well, I haven't worked with that. But she said, well, I did the research and she said in Britain they did a nine month study. It was a basically a, a you know, double blind study where they had a group of people that um, were being treated with the typical dementia protocol, the drugs, etc. And then another group that had that and the therapy, uh, where they did skill sets therapy and they did uh, group work. And then the third group just did uh, hypnosis once a week. They did a group session. And in nine months, the group that did the hypnosis improved more than the other groups, mm. which was quite, I mean, who knows? I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, and I'm not saying that from my experience, I've had some some good results, but it's not my area of expertise. I did work with that fellow. And I'm going to say what I really think it helps with is with lifting the spirits because a person that's dealing with that is going to be feeling pretty down. And frustrated. Frustrated yeah. with it in, in the family, too. It ended up that, you know, his wife actually did some sessions with me as well. And that helped her with the coping. Yeah. But that's, that's big in itself. My dad Making went through it. It was, it, was a, it was a tough thing it's for, for mom, too. It's, yeah. it's a horribly difficult thing. So am I going to say that, you know, I, I can't tell you that, you know, anecdotally I can say there's been improvement, but, you know. All the research that I'm doing on positive psychology is mm -hmm. touching on those types of diseases, even Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, and saying how the this kind of thinking is proving to be better a better cure than than any pharmaceutical or anything that has side effects or um, and it well, does come back to what you said I think I like the word lift your spirits mm -hmm. it's coming back to our spirit self and, and, and there's some yeah. great um, you know pharmaceuticals can have a very good effect for things like dementia so we don't want to take that away you know and if there's any way that I because what I tend to do with that type of thing is I would be like more of an adjunct protocol where they're already, of course, continuing to work with their docs, and I get a lot of referrals from docs as well, and not specifically for that, but for some other things. Sure. And so I always want to look at the baseline, where they're at. You know, oftentimes people will either reduce or get off their depression meds over time, because what do they say about depression? Of course, this is in conjunction with their doctor. I never, ever make recommendations, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, when you think about um, people that are, I would just call it feeling down or they call it feeling depressed or what that often is related to is the future they had imagined they were going to have no longer exists, mm. you know? And, and it's funny, I, I was watching a movie a few weeks back and they used that terminology and I thought that is exactly what it is. But they feel know? like they have no sense of purpose. Right, they lose their sense yeah. of direction, their sense of purpose. There's a, um, a fellow by the name of Seth Godin that he's actually a, an amazing marketing guy, but he's, he's got this inquisitive bent about him. And one of his phrases is becoming nostalgic about our future. You know, <laughs> it's like we had an idea about how our future would be and it's just not turning out that way. There was research on prospection that's really good. It's mm -hmm. actually, um, you know, looking at the future and as a positive um, kind of like blueprint for yourself. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. I found a little piece of research on that. Yeah. It's actually good for us. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad you said that because when people think about hypnosis, sometimes they, it is the old school thing they have in their mind, right? And so what I refer to what I do is helping people to create essentially um, a mind map, you know, uh, right. like you're talking about. So the hypnosis will start to to give them a, I call it a deep mind map, actually, a way of 
having the mind be able to start to track some new things. It's like, let's say somebody wants to lose some weight, and I've worked with thousands of people over the years. I've been doing this 11 years, and I did work for positive changes for eight of those, so weight loss was a big, big part of what we did. And, I mean, one of the things that I always found fascinating is they come back after a couple of weeks and say, well, I went grocery shopping, <coughs> you know, and, uh, excuse me. <coughs> so I went grocery shopping, I went into the store and I'd normally make a left turn to the bakery section. Well, I heard a voice say, you know, go over here and get some fruit and vegetables, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm like, that's the map, right? right? You can override that. I mean, initially, you know, but mm -hmm. it's usually fairly strong. And what it does is help you to start to create those new habits. So that's what hypnosis is really doing is creating a new voice based on what you want. What right. you've decided you is that. your... Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's a I mind, like that. you know, a, a deep mind map because um, it's on rather than because a mind map there is such a term, right? It, but it's a cognitive map, so that's on a cognitive level where we're dealing. I call it a deep mind map because we're we're actually mapping on a subconscious level. If you think about that, so that's a whole different way of looking at process, isn't it? Yeah. And then, you know, and process is important too. That's why I do typically three month or more programs. To, you know, somebody wants to lose a lot of weight, it could take six, yeah. eight, nine. It is a process, you know, changing those patterns. Right. Yeah, it's actually near, they're neurons that, or what is it that needs to be changed? It's exactly. rewiring those. It is rewiring your yeah. synopsis. <coughs> right. Yeah, you're and I know, Scott, I've talked to you about the mapping, yeah. how, you know, envisioning, closing your eyes, seeing your day or how you want it to be. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that practice. Yeah. It's a great practice. I got so big and I'd wanted to. I mean, over like 15 years, yeah. I think I said about, uh, I was thinking about the other, about 30, I started gaining weight. Mm -hmm. And I went from between 30 and 50, I went from 140 pounds to 230 pounds. That's a lot, isn't Th it? That, yeah. that is a lot, you know, where, where bending, bending over to tie your shoelace, especially for a guy mm -hmm. that's five foot four, is like, yeah, that ain't going to happen today. I'm going to wear some loafers. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. and uh, I've never had strong willpower. I mean, my big addiction is nicotine, mm -hmm. uh, but I've never had strong willpower what I thought is enough willpower to do anything. And how I lost all that weight was fear of death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, that yes, was the only yes. thing that got through to my brain. I mm -hmm. wanted to lose the weight. I didn't feel attractive and I was single and all that kind of stuff. And, and but none of that was enough to motivate me until, until I, I found out I was gonna die if I didn't, you know? And, and, yes. and that was, and, and it was a diabetic thing, you know? And wake, it took waking up blind one morning to make me lose the 100 pounds I had gained, you know? Wow. So, or, or want to. And actually you know, strive for it. It's, so. it's interesting that you say that. My This teacher that I worked with for so many years, and he said people come to change. They make change through one of two gateways, either hope or desperation. <laughs> and <he's, laughs> that was desperation. Am I, am I right? <laughs> yes. And he said wow. most of us, it's desperation. Yeah. You know, and, and that's fine. That's that, that piece. And, you know, if people are coming through the desperation, that's okay. I, c I can work with them because now we're going to help to create that hope piece too, nice. right? You know? They're yeah. willing. They have yeah. to. We have to have the you willingness. Be willing. You have to have the desire to change. You do, and it's yes. it's not magic. I yeah, mean, it it's, isn't. It's, it's it's willpower. It's taking responsibility yeah. for, you know, what you have and saying, here, what do I do with this? It's being aware. It's like mm -hmm. there's some factors in there. And yeah. yeah, do you have kind of like a, a little list you could just rattle off of of typical things that that you find people coming to you well, for that you can help them with? It, I you know, we've talked a lot about yes. smoking, but oh, smoking's really one. Of, I, I I do that, and I'm good at it. But it's, um, you know, it's not my key area. I, because, I mean, I'm grateful to help people do that. Uh, but off, what I want to help them do is create a better life. You know, and so what I always say, whatever behavior they're bringing, and it could be stress and anxiety. Uh, it could be. Um, and oftentimes people come with one thing, and then once they get to know me a little better, tell me something else, <laughs> right? You know, it's like well, that smoking's related to all the stress and anxiety. So it, if you don't deal with that, you, you the, yes. you're I think probably decreasing their chances of winning, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so smoking, I would use that as an entry. If somebody has several things they want to deal with, and smoking they want to deal with, let's start with that. You yeah. know, and that's a two-session program. Some of the others are three months. You know, so and that the reason for that. Is, is quite simple. Why can I quit smoking in two sessions? Sometimes they're done in one, but I do two sessions to make sure we really lock it in. And I'm going to invite you to come and do this with me. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, I really, I've been talking yeah. about it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, we're yeah. going to do that. We're going to do two sessions, and um, 
yeah, you'll, you'll definitely be done. If an 82-year-old woman can be done and she's a two-pack-a-day smack, two pack a day smoker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So other things I deal with, of course, are the anxiety. I've talked about weight, weight loss. Um, a lot of business people, I would say high-level executives and uh, a lot of um, sole proprietors, business owners, uh, they'll come to me to help with that motivation piece, you know, how do I keep oh. myself getting up early in the morning and doing what I need to do to succeed, you know, or even when they have succeeded, how do I balance my life? You know, I've oh, got, yeah. I've got <laughs> kids, I've got, yeah. you know, I belong to these different groups where I, you know, I will, um, uh, donate my time, et cetera. And yeah, monster right. job that's like sucking everything out of me. That, that, yeah, like I mean, we, the often, TMI society is what it is. We're all dealing with too much, too much. Yes. And how yeah. to simplify or, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and then finding out what's important to you. You know, it's, uh, it, it's such a, a thing that oftentimes we don't ask that question. What's the most important thing? Or here's a, here's a good one. What am I in service to? And that's, I'm quoting a, a, a teacher named Ajashanti. I that love I, that saying. I did his retreat a couple of years back, um, and I do a lot of Zen retreats and stuff because that's my way of nurturing myself is going and spending uh, or going up into the mountains and camping for a week, you know. Uh, but, yeah, so he, he was asking that question, and it really resonated with me. What, a, what am I in service to? And on one level, I, I know what I do, but it's really about being clear on why you do it, you know? Right. Yeah, why am I doing what I do? And that's a good question to ask oneself because that'll help us to really focus on the most important thing. Sure. You know? And so that's really what I help people do is get that focus, uh, discover what they really want, and then start living into that life. Kind of the big picture. You know, if we're not yeah. allowing ourselves to live the life that we truly want, right. Then we're living somebody else's life. Yeah, and we're, what we value, what we truly deeply mm -hmm. inside value. Mm -hmm. and, and we're here to live our life, so why not live it? Yeah. Right? That's I am me and you are you, and hey, be yourself and let's, let's have some fun. Yes. <laughs> That's how yeah. I look at it. <laughs> oh, I'm with you completely. <laughs> the more that we can step outside of the box, yep. you know, which is really our story. Yeah. The box is our story, you know. <laughs> it kind of keeps us boxed in, prevents us from doing some things that we'd really like to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. James, you have a couple of really yeah. cool life hacks, you're calling them. I like that name. Yeah. You have seven life hacks. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, I sure can. And I'm going to invite anybody who's listening to go to my website, and you can access these because these are in – each one of them is a blog. Okay. So, um, yeah, so – You can just list them off. Sure. I mean, cool. number got, one yeah. – uh, give, your, give your website first. Oh, it's – And we're yeah. going to do it again at the okay, end, but go ahead and throw it up. There. It's intentionalhypnosis.com. Be careful spelling intentional because I, I ordered a sign and the guy that gave it to me made it international. Uh, <laughs> and, and though I am though I am an international man of action. All right. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, Austin Powers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you got it. <laughs> but intentional, intentional, right. because that's that's why I, I created that name because I think if you bring intention, I can help you. All right. All yeah. right. All right. So life hacks. Yeah, intentionalhypnosis.com. So here we are. I've got seven life hacks. And number one really is begin your day with gratitude. You know, start out. I don't care what it takes. The first thing, because think about it. Oftentimes, you know, people wake up in the morning and, you know, I've been that guy. Oh, God, another day, you know, <laughs> right? And then by really starting to set in place this gratitude piece, it becomes Thank you for this day, you know. Thank you for the opportunity to really live another day here and experience some things and be open to. That's the other thing. Part of gratitude is about being open to new things. And it's as if the universe, life, God, however you want to call it, is always presenting us gateways of opportunity, but we're too busy looking backwards to see, yeah. you know. If we're looking at our past, then, or, or, or if we're looking forward through the filters of our past, we're not seeing what's really in front of us. And we may even step into a gateway and close that door pretty quickly because it's unfamiliar. Or we may step into a gateway and all of a sudden stay there far too long because it's familiar to us. So, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the intermediate gate, which is kind of in the middle. And that's right. where most of life is, uh, right in that middle. So we're kind of figuring... 
you know, is this new? Is it different? Is it familiar? You know, is this new relationship that it has, does it have potential or am I going to do a repeat here? I like yeah. to explain situations yeah. similar yeah. like that uh, as far um, like expansion, <coughs> contraction, kind of like the mm -hmm. waves of mm -hmm. the ocean basically. Yeah. We're either in an expanded state like you talked about, mm -hmm. which gratitude um, opens that space and allows us to mm -hmm. e enter in more into the, into the moment and hear and feel more and sense more. Mm -hmm. It's almost like animals are like that mm -hmm. or little children. They just sit there and they're, they're all ears and they're watching and they're curious and they're soaking up everything. Okay. So it's that expanded state, I think, that is allowing this kind of maybe what, you know, higher, um, I know everything's frequency and vibration, but you mm -hmm. know, it does boil down to that, is that we're allowing that higher energy to, Absolutely. to, to, that's to envelop or to incorporate and, and to actually experience versus a contracted state is more like, oh, yeah. fearful, uh, locked in, boxed in. Yeah. And then fight or flight, right? Yeah. Flight, yeah. Yeah. So you already addressed the second one. So, oh, did I? <laughs> she made it oh. easy for me. Well, Sorry. she kind of, so. she can, one thing I've learned from her yeah. that kind of goes along with that yeah. is, is, and I think what you, you were saying in the first part there is, is if you feel uncomfortable, yeah. ask yourself why. Y yes. If a statement yes. or a situation <coughs> yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. makes you feel uncomfortable, why am I feeling uncomfortable? Yeah, it's good Absolutely. to address Why am I afraid to go there? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and that is so important to check in. And to also not feel shame about it, you know, because I think that that's what drags us down. So my second one was be inquisitive, you know, and that's what you were alluding yeah. to there. It's like approach everything with an air of being inquisitive. Because if you have an attitude of finding out what's there, and I got to tell you that in a sense, the unknown piece where it, we don't know what's there, but there can be some tension around that because we like to know before we do anything. <laughs> so we have to, in a sense, yeah. shift out of that space and in, into what I would call a heart space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open myself up, and, and it's a practice. Yeah. But the more that we can allow ourselves to enter a place without any preconceived idea of, of actually what's there, the more we're actually going to learn to live life in a present it's moment. It's way fun. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it, it becomes it magical. <laughs> it is way fun. Yes, it, it is. It is. It allows yeah. yourself choices, allow yourself freedom, giving yourself the compassion you need. And mm -hmm. when we give ourselves compassion, we give others. Mm -hmm. it's a, it works. It's like a mirror. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to let you go through these because we're, we're down to 10 minutes. Okay, and I've got, I've got a Sorry. big question. And plus, okay. I want to give out all your contact information. Okay, okay absolutely. Right. So let's go on to the third one, which is this is a key one. Excellence versus perfection. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, who who isn't hung up on the perfection model, oh, yeah. right? right. And, and we've been sold that. I mean, all the marketing that we get is all oh, about yeah. perfection, right? So, so I developed, and this comes from um, some of the things I worked on some years ago when I wrote my book, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But excellence is, is in a sense of, it's a practice. You know, it's like, Allow yourself to be excellent. And excellence is not perfection. It is making your best effort according to conditions. I've heard it be progress, not perfection as that's well. That's exactly. By some, um, uh, higher thinkers, yes. And, and that's exactly embrace what Embrace your progress. Exactly. What, yeah. Embrace your progress, right? Because you're going to have, when you're inf affecting behavior change, you're going to stumble. So sure. let's move on to the yep. next one here, mm -hmm. which ties into that. And... Uh, Again, I address these. You can go to my website, and these are entire blogs on each one. But find duty, devotion, and purpose. It's a cycle. It feeds one into the other. But duty, we always think of military duty where a person is, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. that's serious duty, <laughs> right? Duty is, well, you know, yeah. that's where we think of it. But there's actually, there, I'm talking here about duty to self. Duty to be your best self each day. And then the devotion is the practice of being your best self. And really, or, or, or taking the, you know, you can break down the particular things that you're working on and have a duty devotion. And then purpose gives meaning to your action. So devotion is an action we take every day towards our, you know, goal would be simplistic, but our intention, right? Whatever it is that we want to achieve. And then purpose is what gives meaning to that action. So again, that's number four. Does, is that yes. sounding pretty Perfect. good? It sounds great. It sounds great, yes. Okay, number five I alluded to a little bit earlier. I said convenience, right, when I started talking. But right. convenience, all those, and we've never, I don't know if we've ever lived in a time where there was more convenience. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, we had one fast food place in the town I lived in. Today we have a fast food place or two on every corner, you know, yeah. <laughs> right? So convenience is what oftentimes 
will stop us from moving forward with behavior change because it's so much more convenient to maintain the existing behaviors. You know, and I did it. I mean, I had a business um, in Dallas, Texas, where I, Im I imported furniture and artifacts out of Indonesia and Thailand. And I had a, a place in Dallas Farmer's Market, which is fantastic, you know, where the thing I liked is a million visitors a year came through there. So, wow. and I was just one of the vendors, but there were many, many fruit and vegetable vendors. And there was a Mercado, and I was in there. And so what I would do in the morning is I'd, I'd, I won't name the place, but I'd hit a fast food place in the morning and, and have a breakfast sandwich, right, of some type. And, you know, and then I can't remember what I'd do for lunch, but maybe I'd skip it. I don't know. But on the way home, I'd often, I, I'd be, I, I would tell people my truck was defective. It would make a hard right turn into a fast food place, right? I, it was did it on its own. Oh. So that's the McDonald's addiction, apparently. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It, there's your addiction. It, you know, and I wasn't that choosy, but I'd pick a yeah. spot, right? Yeah. And, you know, so what happens there is convenience becomes so it's Addictive. easy. And, and the mind yeah. is saying, oh, I'm too tired to cook or there's nothing at home to eat, right? Or, you know, for me, it was usually the food was rotting in the fridge. But let's go on to the next one, right? Sounds like convenience becomes so, addictive. So let me tell you what I do. <laughs> well, it does. Yeah, it does. I don't, I, want you to, I don't want any of my clients to give up convenience. But what I want to do is I want to take those convenient, unproductive behaviors, and over a course of time, we're going to convert those into making our productive behaviors convenient. Ah, <laughs> mm. like that. That's the transition piece, yep. right? Right. So that's called mastering convenience. That's number five, right? And then celebrate the milestones. We really need to celebrate. You yes. know, the changes, we need to, you know, realize that we're moving forward. And, and even the second stage of learning, which, you know, or awareness is what I call it, it's based on a skill sets model from the 1960s. But you're moving, and I've modified it. But what happens is whenever we're learning something new, we start out in unconscious incompetence. We don't know, right? And then we start to know, and guess what? We discover we're incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like all I right? know is I know yes. nothing. Yeah, and the same thing happens when we're changing behaviors. We start to bring awareness to our behaviors, and then, oh, you know, I, I came to you because I was snacking on, you know, these unhealthy foods instead of eating proper meals. And then I was doing really well initially, and I fell back into that old behavior. And, well, no, you probably just became aware of it. You used to do it a lot more. So now you notice that you did it. Well, that's actually a milestone. A step forward. Yeah. It is. It is. So we want to acknowledge that. You know so what I did for milestones is I created a document called milestones when I realized <laughs> when I, 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 I kind of intuitively it. came up with, yeah, you need to start celebrating, congratulating, okay, just to make yourself feel better. So I did. And it did feel better to say, hey, this is what you've done. Because that critic was Mm -hmm. really getting on and yeah. you know, it does get on to you. Yeah. <laughs> so you're bringing in more executive function is what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the f let's finish this with the, yeah. the last one, which is really, I would call the beginning too. It's begin with strong intention, you know, and yeah. intention is figuring out what you really want. You know, what do you really want? And then mapping out how to get there. So that's why we do that process. And I'm going to, you know, you and I will get together, Scott, and uh, do a couple sessions and you'll be a non-smoker. Excellent. Yeah, right, excellent. And, and it'll be because of your intention. So bring a strong intention. And even before you come see me, I'm going to send you some questions I want you to start working with. Okay. All right, okay. James, it yeah. says that you've got this seven life hacks uh, uh, workshop coming up. Is that true? Uh, I am September? going to be setting that up um, in September. Okay. And I haven't got, I've been doing a lot of other things right now and I'm going to be focusing again. Again, summer is not a time to do the workshops because everybody's They're either busy having and fun yeah. out at the lake and they got the kids and kids will get back in right. school so and things. Okay. Yeah. Right. But so down the road you're gonna yes, have something absolutely. on that. I'm, seven I'm hacks. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So September, October we're gonna be doing as that. as we wrap things up, uh, one of the things I noticed on your, your website was your book and it seems very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about Tribalize Now mm -hmm. and the practice of belonging? I like yeah, that. I like Tell that us a little too. bit of that, and well, it says here it's available on Amazon. So, okay, it, it is. And I, I wrote this book. It took me some years, of course, to do it. it was my f first book, and I've got several others in the works that are, you know, not <laughs> not complete. But um, Tribalize Now was really uh, a reflection of the work I did with a tremendous spiritual teacher. His name was Ten Bears. He was uh, trained by um, Wallace Black Elk, who was a Lakota Sioux medicine person. 
And um, before he worked with Wallace, he was, and then he basically was somebody who became enlightened through the Zen tradition. Wow. And then he, it was almost one of those things where he just was with a bunch of therapists who did this weekend workshop and he loved it so much. He and Wallace became fast friends and he asked permission to uh, be able to teach the medicine but modify it slightly because of, um, unless you were raised in that tradition, you probably wouldn't understand it all. Sure. You know, which would make sense. But it's, it's beautiful medicine. So I, of course, blend a lot of things into the work I do, and that's the Zen tradition. I'm a Tai Chi guy. I've done Tai Chi, Qi Kong for 30 years. And, and then, of course, the, the Native American medicine is something that uh, I feel so privileged to have been honored to receive those teachings and have tremendous just tremendous respect for that. Are you and a Native American I yourself? I actually am not. Okay. People often see my name sure. and think I am, but I am not. I have, you know, I would say, you know, uh, I'd call on my brothers and sisters. I would say we share a common heart, you know, and I, um, I wrote this book based on the teachings that my teacher had uh, expressed. And uh, what it did, what it does is it lays out basically one of the most important things that I can share is that we can learn from tribal cultures, and but a lot of, I mean, I'm not just talking Native American, but around the world. Sure. And some really good books have been written on that. Um, and basically, when you are born into a tribe, you, as a little being, are valued for what you're able to bring to that tribe. And so everything that is involved in your education is towards the support of the tribe. You know, you, you are honored for what you do and honored for your natural gifts that you bring. And I really focus on that in the book and get into a lot more detail with that. But I think that's one of the most important things that we can take home is within a tribe. And of course, they have a practice that they do that, I mean, sustains the teachings and the uh, traditions of the tribe for hundreds, if not a thousand years. That so. every one, mm -hmm. every person is valued and a part of the whole Yes. And makes it makes the whole operation work basically just like a car's car's engine. Mm -hmm. You take something out and it doesn't work. So Absolutely. It's the same thing that yeah. we're coming back to. We are coming back to tribal uh, ways. I, I believe we are and valuing e each other and as the same and special. Mm -hmm. Basically. And so I just want to honor that and that's why I wrote that book and uh um yeah, you can find it on Amazon. And, and once again, the title, Tribal Lies Now, The Practice of Belonging, James Barfoot. Yeah, All right, you. James, your website, I want to throw that out again. It's intentionalhypnosis.com. Are there any other, do you have a Facebook page, anything else you want to I give do. out to people? Uh, it's called The Intentional Human Project. Okay. Yeah, it's on Facebook, and it's all, again, about intention and, and, and really being human, all right? right? You know, and I post my workshops and things on there as well. So now, on your is there another is there a link to that website through the Intentional Hypnosis website? Oh, let's see. <laughs> I, I, I'm not yeah. sure, but I, I because um, just so pe people want to find you, I did post on our Facebook page. I post a link to your website. Oh, good. So, so Thank if people you are looking that. looking at Thank it just to do it real easy, want to yeah. get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. um, best way to do that website. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You bet. And Thank I you for the trip this morning and coming down. We know that that can be a lot sometimes in the oh, morning. Oh, it was. So. It was fantastic. It's right. great and if people want to come visit, uh, where where are you, uh, James? I am actually. I have the easiest place to find. Really, um, I'm at the junction. I'm right downtown, across from the old Davenport. I look out my second floor window at the Palm Grill across the street. So, <laughs> okay. you know, I can get a breakfast there if I want, right? All right, all right. <laughs> and so I'm on the corner of Lincoln and First Avenue. It's uh, 827 West First Avenue. All right. And, uh, you know, give me a call and, you know, we can set something up. But it, it's been an honor to, to sit with you folks. And no, the honor is ours. Thank you yes, so much for coming in, you, sharing your knowledge and uh, what you do to help people. Can I people. call you Dr. Barfoot? No. <laughs> 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 Thank you. All right, big round of applause, James Barfoot. And that is our show for today. We will not have any community calendar. Don't forget, tomorrow is a Rocket Out Friday.